As we make these SH-2G helicopters ready for delivery to the Navy, it's a good time to reminisce on the beginning of it all, the original vision, the saga of the K-125, the first helicopter built by then Command Aircraft Corporation. Here's the story. The dream of 1945-46 was that the Command K-125 would be a helicopter that could be flown by anyone, everywhere, and would really darken the skies. Two people in the back, one in the front. The work began on the test trig to prove the rotor incorporating our aerodynamic servo flaps would work. Long, long hours were spent there, and eventually we built the first airframe, the K-125. We took it out for its earliest flights in January of 1947. Bitter cold, we were to encounter our first major disappointment. The clutch would not engage. It seemed that the delicate balance between the spring rate and the shoes of the clutch to engage the rotor was just wrong. And as it would come up to speed, it would start chattering sending enormous torsional vibrations into the blades and how they held together and didn't break under that punishment was really very surprising. We tried and tried. And finally, on January the 15th, we made two changes in the blizzardy, cold, rain, sleet, Oh, it was bad weather. We had to fly on that day because that was the day the $36,000 provided us by New Enterprises would be gone. And that was to have a first flight. These films show it in the late afternoon of that day. And we almost made flight here, but not quite. Flight occurred six inches off the ground against the ropes at dusk when no longer was there enough light to have a record of it. But we do have a record in the minds of all the people that were there, emblazoned forever. The crew had worked very, very hard. Long hours were almost a starting point. The bitter cold was something you took for granted. But it flew. And it really was a great, great emotional release when that occurred. A few days later, we went outside with Eddie gone on a Sunday morning, pulling down on the tail of the bird every time it would get off the ground. The whole crew were there. We didn't have hard hats or any protective measures. What we would do if something went wrong was not even a consideration. It was not expected and it did not occur. The first flights in this way and what followed a few days later, as the snow began to ease off, was the first realization, having fixed the clutch, that our control sensitivity was too great. You see here, when it took off, the pilot was immediately over-controlling, and the ship was bouncing around. 
That was resolved by changing the ratio of the control from the pilot stick to the servo flaps. Meantime, the rotor had been designed to be a single degree of freedom teeter, like a seesaw. But in the presence of a large coning angle, which means a lot of lift, that can give rise to very serious Coriolis forces, which come from acceleration in the plane of rotation. We didn't expect to have coning angles so high, but it didn't appear that they were going to get any less with the configuration that we had. So we resolved to put in a lead lag hinge to relieve the Coriolis forces. That also necessitated a, necessitated a lead lag damper, and that was made by a couple of tubes with brazing brass in between as a friction device. All of this was done in a matter of days, a week or two at the most. And in the resolution of all of this, we were solving major, major problems. We didn't know it then. There was no textbook. There was no guidance. And furthermore, nobody in the world had ever flown a servo-controlled rotor of this configuration. Meanwhile, I had selected an intermeshing configuration in order to save the power that's otherwise wasted in a tail rotor. So even that was new. Although it had been done in Germany during the war, we didn't have access to any of the German data, and we really didn't know what we were getting into until we got there. Flights continued little by little, improvements day by day. And finally, we were ready to venture into a little bit of forward flight as well as hovering. These were very exciting days, and that's the ramp out there by the revetment at Bradley Field still showing those devices built during the war, World War II, for protection of Bradley Field. The bird was much more stable now. It was really showing its potential as we eased it into forward flight. And suddenly, in addition to hovering, we were flying. Flying with great success. It was clear now that we had the solution. Everyone was thrilled and happy. Watch Schuler dance in the background there. There he goes. After all the effort and the painstaking night and day, suddenly we had reached the point where Jack Rohr, our pilot, was beginning to practice for the big demonstration for new enterprises that was scheduled for Good Friday. Well, in effect, he had to learn to fly this plane. It was unlike any other. And as we would learn with time, much more forgiving, more docile, more stable, but the control forces just moving the little servo flap were almost negligible. And it was virtually fingertip control, unheard of at the hour, at the day, at the time. Other helicopters changed their rotor blade pitch at the root and had a horn attached to the control from the pilot that moved the blades. Pilots would virtually get muscle spasms after an hour or so 
they were enormously difficult to fly. And those forces were very, very great. To be resolved years later with hydraulic servos. But here the Command K-125 was flying with an aerodynamic servo flap. And it had virtually minimal, minimal control forces. No one had ever flown such a plane before. And hence it was necessary for Jack to learn how to fly it, which is what he was doing in all of these sequences. In and out of ground effect, sideways, turning, forward, backwards. All of the maneuvers a helicopter is expected to do. When the great day came, on Good Friday, we were ready. And the exhibition that was put on was truly remarkable. In fact, everyone was absolutely thrilled beyond belief. Here we go with just about every maneuver a helicopter is expected to do. And it was all done within literally weeks, days of its very first flight, incorporating new technologies for which we had only raw intuition and engineering common sense as a guide. So here we are demonstrating on Good Friday. And we were all just thrilled to death. Marshall McGuire, Lou Schuler, Lynn Crosley, Dave Ravenhorst, myself, Jack Rohr. Of course, Bill Murray was there, Marty Stevens, there were many others. And this was the flyby on Good Friday that got underneath Jim, uh, Gene Hotchkiss to the extent that he had to slap me on the back right there. Success was very delicious. Well, now everyone said, well, of course, you've flown your principles here. You've demonstrated that. But let's finish the bird. Why don't we make it into a helicopter that you can raise money with? And let's do it fast, because it was perfectly obvious we would need a lot of money. So we proceeded to finish it by degrees. We added the tail, first off. And now Bill Murray had taken over flight testing from Jack. And the beginning was to illustrate how this new technology actually worked. Many people raised the question of tip clearance. Actually, in all of the years of flying since 1947, We've never even had a close call with the tip. But nonetheless, in these early, early days, everything had to be shown. It could not be taken for granted. The control stick, the cyclic stick here, moves fore and aft and laterally to tilt the rotor plane. It does so, that's both rotors, it does so by tilting the gimbal ring shown here, which in turn introduces pitch in one direction to the flaps on one side of the rotor disc and pitch in the opposite direction on the other side of the disc. Thereby, the rotor disc tilts and it flies in the direction of tilt. This is the collective stick. And here, the control moves together all around. 
in order to increase or decrease pitch and thereby climb or descend. Again, it moves the servo flap. The blade changes pitch by elastic torsion. And here was the rudder, and the rudder control moves the collective pitch in the two rotors differentially to unbalance the torque. So we went on with this, finishing the bird by degrees. Unfortunately, in our haste to get it done, we abandoned the need and the cost of making tools to make aluminum forms and bulkheads and to have a proper lightweight skin. We made it out of 3 8 of an inch plywood for the bulkheads and we covered it with plywood also, maybe a 16th of an inch, an eighth of an inch, that kind. This tended to increase the weight and that was bad. The weight went way up, much too fast. And by the time we got around to finishing the bird and roll it out as a sparkling red flaming machine, it was pretty badly overweight. So much so that when we flew it, in this configuration, we knew that the 125 horsepower four-cylinder engine was not sufficient to do the job. We did prove a lot of things with this. This was about the closest we would get to that original artist version that was shown at the beginning of this film. It sort of closely resembled that. But in real life, flight begins by tracking the rotors. And that means making each blade pass in the path of the predecessor. Bill was away at this time, and I was doing the tracking work, which consisted of painting or shall I say, rubbing the tips of the blades with chalk, different color, and then striking a flag, a tracking flag, which was a portion of an old inner tube mounted over there on the side, as you can see. The impact from the blades brushing by the rubber would leave marks which would denote how far apart the blades were and which color blade was high or low. Having got the rotors tracking, Bill proceeded with the flying, but alas, it was quite clear now that we were simply underpowered. So we took the tail boom off, we took the engine, and we took it out and put in a six-cylinder like homing of 185 horsepower and suddenly we had enough power. These flights were made to check the drive system. That's why the tail hadn't been added right away. And the drive system was, after all, exhibiting the most singular advantage of the intermeshing helicopter, simplicity. The engine drove directly into the gearbox, a single gearbox, which drove the shafts, which turned the rotors. That principle is even more vivid in its value today than in these early years when the concepts were laid down. Simplicity and reliability cannot be overrated. And the absence of the tail rotor and all of the intermediate gearboxes and the tail rotor components and so on was really an early revelation of how much more efficient would be the intermeshing configuration. It was proven right here 
in 1947 and in 1948. But we learned something else at that time. The CAB, Civil Aeronautics Board, issued new regulations that would be impossible to fulfill with our meager capital resources. We would have to abandon the concept of the K-125. And in its place would come a special helicopter a special agricultural plane for dusting, spraying, fogging, and whatever, because in this manner, the new K-190 would be within our means to certificate with the then CAA under the new CAB rules. So as these flights were winding down, we knew that the K-125 had done its bit. It had proven our principles, and we were very grateful for all that we had learned and the marvelous safety that had been achieved with this early plane. We did go further. We put a single large fin on it, and I undertook to fly it. The comic relief of the captions of the day, notwithstanding, it was great fun. I didn't even have a pilot's license. I took my hand off the controls to wave. And then, of course, maneuvering, turning, all of the rest, it was just great fun. The covering around the nose section had been removed at the time, but it was restored a little later on. And then we had the K-125 and the K-190 flying together. And as the K-125 was winding down its purpose and use, the K-190 would come in and take over. Bill was flying the 190, and I was flying the K-125. We had a fleet of helicopters. By the way, that building back there was the gymnasium, which was our home, 10,000 square feet, at Bradley Field. The K-190, K-225 series aircraft became the cornerstone of command aircraft's entry into the helicopter industry. Both were certified by the then CAA, today FAA. But the K-125 had a few other tricks up its sleeve. We participated in a movie that was locally done, and we dolled it up again, put on the front frames, painted it up, so that it could participate in that filming. We went on from there to actually put more fins on the back end, as originally contemplated, to explore stability and control, and it's shown here in that configuration. I was flying it again, and this is sort of the wind-up before its final retirement. So looking back, we had a concept, we had a dream, we had an ambition. And we proceeded to try to make it happen. Life can be cruel for reasons beyond our control, the CAB. That was not attainable. We had to divert our energies in other directions. But the triumph of success does not go away. And the success that is achieved through extreme efforts is with you for the rest of your life. The confidence that this early work gave us in ourselves in the absence of any precedent whatsoever 
that we could call upon was truly one of the greatest confidence builders one could ever expect. It was a joy, it was a privilege, it was an extreme exertion to show what man can do. It meant the safety of the company, it meant the safety of all the people, it meant command aircraft would go forward in its role in helicopters in the United States. And with a heroic start, such as the K-125, indeed, command did go forward and play a role in the development of the helicopter industry in America. We built helicopters for the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, the Navy again, and played a principal role in the development of technology in rotary wing aircraft. Today, after nearly 50 years, we are able to call on that technology to take us into the 21st century with a new vision, a new vision of an aerial truck. It's called the K-MAX.